You may be seated. So good morning. Good morning. I pray you you had a blessed week. Well, some of you, huh? <laughs> um, if you need a Bible, if you forgot your Bible, you know, at home or whatever, raise your hand and the ushers will give you a Bible. And also, uh, you can hear the message interpreted in Spanish if you want. And little by little, we're going to be adding more and more Spanish lyrics to the songs, uh, suggestion from one our parishioners here. And so, uh, little by little, you see more and more changes taking place here. You know, there's so much... Oh, first of all, can't forget this. I want to welcome our new visitors, those that I've met so far. There's James and Lorena. Uh, they, were, they were sitting back in the corner. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Philip, his first time here. Philip, where are you? Anybody see Philip? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And we also have Sylvia and Cruz. Sylvia and Cruz. Okay. Yeah. So welcome. It's an honor to have you. Uh, in fact, you chose to join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You know, there's so much going on in this on this church. As you know, yesterday we had God's Giving Hearts been going on for years now. Diana, that's her ministry, and she's been doing that year after year after year. Uh, where we give out food and clothing to the those in need. And then we had the health fair. See, this is what God wants us to do as a church, to be a light within the community, to help those in need within the community. Do what we can. And it gives us a chance to spread the gospel with others. But there's just so much going on. And then uh, after service today, we have a, a luncheon for, for you elderly. <laughs> Uh, I'm the leader of the pack, right? <laughs> anyway, um, you know what I like to see? We have we have newcomers come to our church, and right away they they feel at home. Uh, we have people come, they visit, they leave, they come back, and they just say they feel so comfortable here. Because we are one family. What you see is what you get. There's no pretense with us, okay? And uh, we have one, one family that uh, they came here right away. They, they got involved with the church. The children, everyone got involved. And every Saturday, they were here passing out food uh, to the needy. And now they told us last week that they have to be moving to Missouri, and would we pray for them? So if we could have Gilbert and Kimberly and Rhea, if you, you could come up here, and Eric and Jaden Jr. By the way, they became involved in the church. Every single Saturday morning, they were here to hold just passing out food, but they just made themselves at home, really, truly a part of uh, the Oasis family. And what Gilbert told me last week, he said that we have to go to Missouri, but we're going to take a piece of Oasis with us. Amen. Okay. <laughs> so, I'd like to send them off in prayer, if, if a some of you can maybe gather around and we, and we can pray for them. Uh, Father, we know that the family here, Father, that was called to our church, that immediately became a part 
of the family of Oasis, Father. Now they're being called to another place, Father. We know it's your calling. And Father, we ask now, as they leave for Missouri, as they said, they want to take a piece of Oasis with them. What they really mean, Father, they have you in their heart now. And no matter where they go, Father, they're going to worship you. They're going to praise you. Father, they know that you are leading them now the place that they're going. And everything will work out well. Father, they have challenges in their life that they're going to work out and continue to grow in their faith and their love for you, Father. But they can't do it on their own, Father. So we ask the Holy Spirit now, be with them wherever they go, that the angels will protect this entire family. Bless them in everything they do. And every single thing that they do, Father, that it praises you, it glorifies you, Father. Father, help them remain faithful and obedient as they have been here, Father. No matter where they go and what they're faced with, but they put their faith and their trust in you, Father. Now bless them, Father, and may wherever they do, whatever they, wherever they go, that they will be successful. They give you all the praise and glory, and they will reflect your light, your love, your grace, your mercy to others, Father. And we ask, lift this prayer for you, and we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And and we have a cake. Uh, we have a going away cake for you, and uh, we'll be fellowshipping. Except for the old, the seniors, they'll be doing their lunch. <laughs> but we have a cake for you also. So. You know, I was thinking, uh, I guess I read something the other day about those who turn their back on, on God. And when I hear things like that, you know, it troubles me. And I've been thinking about why would someone turn their back on God? I was thinking about that. Because when they turn their back on God, it, it doesn't hurt God, <laughs> you know. They're only hurting themselves because they're just sealing their faith that they will be going to hell if they turn their back on God. So I was thinking about this. Why would someone turn their back on God? What, you know, what benefit would it be for them to do that? And I started thinking about this because surely they must know that if there's a heaven, that there is a hell. Surely they must know if they turn their backs on God, they're still in their own faith. So I was thinking about that. And then I began to realize, really, it's really an ego problem. It's what it is. The same ego problem that Satan had when they think highly of themselves, then they start judging God. Same thing Satan did. The Bible says he started thinking more of himself than was necessary, then he started judging God. He wanted to be like God. He told Eve in the Garden of Eden, you know, God was a liar and so forth. So I started thinking about that. People who turn their backs on God are on the same path that Satan was on. Thinking highly of themselves, making themselves equal to God, then they start judging God. Same thing Satan was doing. They seal their fate. Satan and his angels will be going to hell. They're sealing their fate too. And I'm thinking about these people. I pray for them because what they don't realize because of their ego. They must humble themselves. See, some people think life is about themselves, but life is about God. See, God doesn't exist for our good pleasure. We exist for God's good pleasure, okay? And God doesn't exist to do our will. We exist to do God's will, okay? And and God doesn't owe us a single thing, but we owe God because he gave his only begotten son to pay our sin debt. See, and this is what they don't realize. They must humble themselves because that, that ego path that they're on, the same path as Satan was on, they will end up exactly where Satan's going to end up. But see, when I hear things like that, it bothers, bothers, this is not part of my sermon. It's just, I'm offloading what's on my shoulders, things like this. 
It just bothers me when I, when, when I, when I hear things like that. Amen? Okay. Let's bow our heads and uh, give reverence to the Lord. Give him prayer. God, Heavenly Father, we uh, humbly come before your throne, Father. Father, keep us humble. You're the creator. We're the creation, Father. We're here today to glorify you, to praise you. Help us, Father. May your Holy Spirit overflow in us today. Father, I'm praying that we'll feel your presence here, the Holy Spirit's presence with us today. As we hear the message prepared for us, Father, open our heart, our minds, our ears <coughs> to the things we will hear today and to build that love relationship that we have with you, even more so than what it is today, Father. So, Father, please, open our heart. And may the Holy Spirit work in the way that each of us needs to be worked on. As the scripture says, the Holy Spirit will work on us to become more like Jesus. And he won't stop until the work is complete. So, Father, now we ask to you touch our heart as we listen to the, the message today, Father, and touch my lips to say the things that you want me to say and forget those that you don't want me to say. And all that I say, it will glorify you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to say one thing. I know every now and then we get a comment about sometimes I mention a scripture and it's not up there on the screen. The reason for that, I start writing my sermon Monday or Tuesday, and usually I'm not even done until Saturday. <clears throat> and so sometimes I come up with scriptures, and then our secretary only works through Thursday. So Friday, Saturday, when I add new scriptures, then it just simply can't be up here. And that's why I'll tell you in advance, please make a note of the scripture. So it's not delivered sometimes when I mention scripture, it's not there. It's just that I'm working Tuesday through Saturday on my sermon and not many times I simply don't have the scripture available at that time. Uh, so that's the reason why you don't see it up here sometimes. But so just please make a note if I mention a scripture and we don't show it up here. We don't... Last week... Well, first of all, as you know, we're in the book of Galatians. The last couple months, first couple months of, of the year that uh, we were in Ephesians. Now remember, in every one of the letters here that Paul writes, he writes to these churches, the churches in Ephesus we did the past uh, January, February, middle of March. And now he's writing to the churches in the southern part of Galatia, Galatia, Galatia here. That's what the book of Galatians is about. Even if it's the churches in the Corinthian churches or the Colossians. But when Paul are writing these letters to the churches, he's writing them to address situations that are taking place within those churches. And that's what he's addressing. Because remember now, Christianity was new. The churches were new. And people were going through many, many changes, adjustments in their life to please the Lord. So there's issues in every one of these churches, but these issues go back down to the, the problem is that we are all sin, sinners. And so a lot of these issues are simply to do with the fact that they were sinners. The Holy Spirit, of course, is working with them as he's working with us. And also keep in mind Satan is trying to destroy these churches. Okay. Trying to cause all the confusion he he can within the church. So this is what's going on in a lot of these churches that Satan is writing about. The same way here. So by us going through the book of Galatians here, see, we can learn a lot because some of these very same issues that were present in the churches in Paul's day are present here today. So we can learn from, as the scripture tells us, we can learn from how Paul handled this situation, how he handled these various issues because they indeed will apply many cases to maybe situations that are going, with us, going on with us personally or going on within our church. Now I mentioned last week, Paul mentioned that he had received 
the gospel as a revelation from Jesus Christ himself. He said he received it personally from Jesus Christ. Okay? He said he was not taught the gospel that he was teaching. He was not taught it by the apostles. He, say, he says he was not taught it by man, but he said he received the gospel he was teaching directly from Jesus Christ himself. And after he received the gospel, it says that he went to Arabia for three years. For three years he was there teaching the good news of the gospel, the good news of God's kingdom. He was teaching it to the Gentiles there in Arabia. Okay? So for three years he was teaching the gospel to them, all on his own. Okay? Because he was commissioned to teach the gospel to the Gentiles. Then since after three years, then he briefly met with Cephas or Peter and James briefly and then he, he was going again for another two years. And so it was about five years before he actually this first time to Jerusalem to actually meet the other apostles. About five years had passed. Okay? Now Paul when he went to Arabia those three years we know of course that he the Holy Spirit was working with him teaching him an, under, an in-depth understanding of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ himself was revealing in-depth information to Paul. Some of the mysteries about the gospel was being revealed to Paul during those three years. So Paul was learning himself. Okay? As I said, he ended up writing 13 books of the 27 books of the New Testament. But he got this information from the Holy Spirit and he got it from God. Okay? Now, there was a teaching taking place within the church and in Galatian churches. And they were trying to, because we know that, as I mentioned last week, the Judaizers were trying to focus on work. The Judaizers were trying to say, in addition to receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you also had to depend on works. And they were also trying to say that you had to be circumcised. So Paul now went to Jerusalem. It's been about 14 years or so. He went to Jerusalem but we know that this was God's plan for Paul to go to Jerusalem to address the situation of circumcision within the church that the Judaizers were saying that really you had to also be circumcised along with other works they were trying to say that you had to do to be saved. So we really know that Paul was meeting with the church leaders here because of this issue of circumcision. And if you look at verse 3, if you go to Galatians chapter 3, um, chapter 2, I'm sorry, but look at verse 3, Galatians chapter 3, but look at verse 3, and you see there that they're talking about circumcision, see? See, how did this come about? And it came about through the Judaizers. Now look at verse 4 also. Verse 4 says, this matter arose, and this matter of circumcision, because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. See, so these Judaizers, they had infiltrated the ranks up. Matter of fact, most of the Judaizers were, let me say this, the leadership within the church was mostly Judaizers. And so they were causing confusion within the church trying to say yes you needed works and they were also trying to say that you had to be circumcised. So they had infiltrated the church and they saw all the freedoms that the people had with, by just believing in Christ as you're saved by grace. See, the freedom in Christ when the Bible says you're free in Christ means they were no longer bound by the works of the law. There's over 600 uh, laws and commandments and things that you had to do. They were free from all of this. The law said you, you could only walk so far on the Sabbath that you couldn't mix uh, wool and silk together, that you couldn't eat certain foods. But there are so many different laws that they were bound from, so now they were free because when you believe it's Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know you're saved by grace alone through faith and not by works. So now they were free of all these laws that they were bound by from the Mosaic Law, the Old Testament. And so now they were, they were free, and some Judaizers really didn't like that, and they still were trying to make these people slave once again by putting that burden of works on top of them. 
And this is what the issue was here, and one of the burdens was circumcision. And this is one of the issues that Paul was trying to address here within the church. As I mentioned today, the cults today are nothing but modern day Judaizers. Because if you look at any of the cults today, they have a list of do's and don'ts. You can't do this or you must do that. Every one of the cults. They're simply modern day Judaizers. And the cults do this again because they want to control you. That's what it's about, about control. They want to burden you. Okay. They want to make you slaves again to works. In the same way that Judaizer and Paul, again, they're trying to make them slaves again to works. And we are not saved by works. We're saved only by the grace of God. Faith in Jesus Christ. So the Judaizers were just trying to, uh, to use fear, or trying to force their beliefs on the Gentiles who weren't even bound, who became believers in Jesus Christ, who weren't even bound by the law. Now, one thing about the cults today, they have all these works, I was thinking about that, all these do's and don'ts, but none of the do's they have, but none of the works they have are based on love. None of, none of them are based on love for another, to help others out of love and to be generous to others. None of them at all. Okay? Now this Judaizer tried to get Paul to have Titus circumcised, even though he was a Greek. And Paul rejected flatly. He would not have anything to do with that. See, if Paul and Titus had to gave in to their request, a Judaizer's request to have tied to circumcise, if they had uh, given in to that, they would have been nothing except hypocrites. Because Paul and them was teaching, preaching one thing, but then they would have been doing another, but they would have been hypocrites. Now, you must understand, Paul wasn't against circumcision. Because if you want to be circumcised because of health reasons, whatever, sanitary, if you, Paul wasn't against circumcision itself. Paul was against people believing that you had to be circumcised in a, as a work in addition to believing in Jesus Christ. So making myself clear, see, Paul wasn't against circumcision. He was against people believing that you had to have that as a work to be saved. That's what Paul was against, okay? He, he just did not want people believing what the Judaizers believed that you had to be circumcised as part of your salvation. And it was, simply was not true. So that's what Paul was against. Now Paul was not going to have any of that. And, and, he, and he didn't care what they said. If you look at verse 6, it says, As for those who were held in high esteem, this is within the church, whether whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. So Paul didn't care who they were within the church. They were held up in high esteem, these Judaizers. Paul didn't care who they were. Okay? He wasn't going to have any part of that. He said, God does not show favoritism. And what he's talking about here, he's saying, God not showing favoritism in the sense that God didn't give them a different gospel than what God gave of Paul, what Jesus gave Paul. So that's what he said. God's not showing favoritism. God didn't give them a different gospel that included circumcision, and God didn't give it to me. This is what Paul, Jesus didn't give it to me. This is what Paul is talking about. And that's why Paul went on to say that nothing was added to my gospel. That's what he was saying. No, God didn't show favoritism and, and gave you a different gospel than me or added something to that. And that's what Paul meant by nothing was added to his gospel. Now, Paul, of course, was not in, intimidated at all by what they were trying to do. But it shows you, see, he was well grounded in God's word. And it's being well grounded in God's word that keep us from being, keeps us from being, uh, what's the word I want? Keeps us from believing false doctrine. It keeps us from becoming confused. And that's why we must be in God's word constantly to be well grounded in the God's word. See, we preach the same gospel here at Oasis that the same gospel that Paul 
received from Jesus Christ. We preach that very same gospel here. And that regardless of your race, your sex, regardless if you're Jew or Gentile, regardless of your nationality, well, your social status, your education, it really doesn't matter because all of, all of us can be saved by believing in Jesus Christ. And that's what the gospel is all about. Amen. So, so now we must have the same steadfastness as Paul had. Paul was not going to have any of that. He wasn't going to budge from what he knew what God's word said. He wasn't going to be pressured into that. See, and sometimes we have our relatives or friends or neighbors, they mean well, and maybe they're trying to get us to change what our beliefs or change our view of the scripture, see? But we must not let them pressure into that. We must stick to God's word, what it says, and not to waver from that, not from the slightest bit. So we must keep that mindset as Paul had. And if right now you're, pro you're chapter 2, right, of Galatians now, Go to chapter 1. It may be on the same page. If not, go to chapter 1 and look at verse 10. Paul says this. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of crime. So Paul is saying, no. Who am I trying to please? People or am I trying to please God? He said, if I'm trying to please people, then I surely wouldn't be a servant of God. So you see what Paul's telling you here? We, we, we must be conscious of the fact and look at our life. Who am I trying to please the way I'm living my life? Am I trying to please people or am I trying to please God? So if you're trying to please people, then you can't be a servant of God because many people are, are against servants of God. Many people are against God's word. Many people are against what the Bible says. So Paul is saying, now who am I trying to please? I am trying to please God. And we must make up our mind here. I know we have. But we must always be conscious of the fact. Okay, man. I know we have. We must be conscious of that fact. And everything we do, sometimes we may have to stop and check. Am I doing this to please man or am I doing this to please God? And that's what's important. Every single thing that we do in life everything, and I've said this more than once, we must always stop and say, am I, is this glorifying God? Am I glorifying him? Am I pleasing him? Or am I doing this to please some person? Uh, while Paul was dealing with these false brothers, he also had to deal with, with the hypocrisy amongst the apostles, believe it or not. So he's dealing with these false brothers, these Judaizers and their perverted gospel that they were corrupting the church with, confusing the church. But at the same time now, he had to deal with hypocrisy with, within uh, the, the apostles themselves. If you read the same thing, please, and let's read chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Okay. We stand with me. Galatians chapter 2. I see my lights getting dimmer and dimmer. When Cephas, and uh, the King James may say Peter, same thing. When Cephas came to uh, Antioch, I opposed him. This is Paul speaking here. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from, from, from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish custom? We who are Jews by birth are not sinful Gentiles. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but the, by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus. 
that he may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I die to the law so that I might live for God. For God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. So Paul here is addressing hypocrisy. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever invited someone to church? And I know you have. But have you ever invited someone to church to have them respond that, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Tempting as it may be, don't answer and say, one more won't hurt. <laughs> that will never go to church say. <laughs> um, I read a of a research project that took place 12 years ago. And it said 80, and it, it was for non church goers, and it said 85% of non church goers said they didn't go to church because the church is nothing but hypocrites, full of hypocrites. 85% of them. Why does the world view us as hypocrites? See, think about that. See, a dictionary says a hypocrite is a person pretending to be something he is not, especially in the area of morals or religion. See, hip hypocrisy, of course, is a sin, and like all sin, it, it comes from our sinful nature, and at times it raises our ugly head. See, hypocrisy is wanting someone to believe something falsely about us that, that's simply not true. See, hypocrisy, sometimes it raises his head and that's when we want to be accepted by someone for whatever reason, or maybe because of fear. So hypocrisy is when we want something to believe something about us that simply was not true. See, the majority of Christians are quick to, to promote the gospel, to talk about salvation. The majority of Christians are quick to tell others, or people in the world, about, you know, the loving kindness of God, how generous are they should be, how loving they should be, how kind they should be, how forgiving they should be. And the world knows it, and, and about keeping God's commandments. So the world's aware of that we should be kind, loving, and generous. The world's aware that we should be forgiving. The world's aware of the fact that we should be keeping the Bible's commandments. See, the world is aware of this, and when they see we are not doing this, then in their eyes, we're nothing but a hypocrite. See? They may not say it to you, but that's what they're thinking. Oh, you're nothing but a hypocrite. See, hypocrisy is when we choose to sin, and we do choose to sin. It's when we choose to sin over doing God's will. See, the world's aware of the fact that, oh, we chose to sin. They're aware of that, so they're looking at us, and they're thinking, yeah, you're nothing but a hypocrite. And this is the view of the world has of us because oftentimes we put ourselves in that situation where we appear to be a hypocrite. See, when the world sees us doing exactly the same sins as they're doing, then in their eyes, yeah, we're hypocrite. You know, Jesus said that we're in the world but not to be part of the world. See, Jesus said we're... We're not supposed to be part of the desires of the world because they ha have nothing to do with the desires of God. The beliefs of the world, they're not the beliefs of the Bible. The morality of the world surely is not the morality of the Bible because they're all against God. 
So when the world sees us doing these things, they, the world knows that we should not be doing those. So in their eyes, yeah, we're a hypocrite, see. And that's what that survey was showing. 85% of non -church churchgoers see us as hypocrites. Now look at the hypocrisy that we just read about, of all people from Peter and some of the other apostles there. Paul had to approach Peter to his face about that situation. In verse 12, it says, Before certain men came from James, talking about Jews, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when, when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. See, what is Paul is talking about here? See, Peter was eating with the Gentile. Buddy, buddy, and eating all the various foods. That could, they weren't bound by the law. They could eat any food that they wanted to. Paul said, you don't judge people by what goes in, what they eat. So, but then when James showed up with the Jews, Peter withdrew himself now. And he wouldn't have anything to do with them. So now Peter went over to the Jews. The circumcised Jews, they still, they still believed that some of them you should be circumcised. Some, some of them were Judaized, you should be circumcised. And some of them, Jews still viewed the Gentiles as sinners. So Paul, Peter, withdrew himself from that. And so he was being a hypocrite. And this is why Paul got very upset over this, that Peter was nothing but a hypocrite. Look at verse 13. It said, The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by the hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, even Barnabas was led astray by this hypocrisy. This is very upsetting to Paul. You see Peter, Barnabas, and the other Jews being hypocrites. See, we, we must examine our walk with the Lord. We must examine everything that we do on our job, at work, with our neighbors. Are we being a hypocrite? Are we going against what we actually believe? Are we going against what the Bible actually teaches? See, we can't do that. We can't go there. We must take a stand. Either we're Christians or we're not Christians, okay? Either we were saved by the blood of Christ and he's our Lord, and our Lord, which means we'll do what he says, or we're not, see? And so this is very upsetting to Paul. The way we live our life, see, reflects on the church. The way we live our life, because the world is watching us, it reflects on Jesus Christ. It reflects on our Heavenly Father, who's raising us in God's word. So it's very so this is very upsetting to Paul. In verse 14 it says, and, and it's a little difficult to understand, but, but Paul co confronted Peter about this. You know. Yeah, you eat with the Gentiles, Peter. About their, any food you want, but then you just eat the kosher foods when the Jews came around there. So Paul approached Peter and said, look at the message you're sending to the Gentiles. You're sending a message to the Gentiles that maybe they should be like the Jews, which is being a hypocrite. In verse 14 it says, it is not in line with the truth of the gospel. And that's what Paul was telling Peter. Because the truth of the gospel is that we're saved by grace through faith. But Peter was sending the message, no, it's through works. And so Paul there again was had to confront Peter on this. Can you relate to what I'm saying? Have you ever been put in a situation yourself where you were almost forced to be or put in a situation of being a hypocrite? Maybe it was to be accepted by certain people, certain groups. Maybe it's because, yeah, you did not want to be rejected. Maybe it was out of fear. Maybe it, it, out of fear of you wouldn't get this promotion or you wouldn't get this job, so you pretend to be something that you weren't. 
See, it's so easy for us to put ourselves in that situation to be a hypocrite to the world. And to the world, we're just nothing but a hypocrite. See, sometimes fear can take over our love for Christ, as it did with Peter there in that situation. And we know it did with Peter when Jesus was being, being arrested. Three times, out of fear, Peter denied knowing Jesus Christ. Here again, out of fear, Peter, of those circumcised, out of fear, Peter withdrew himself from the Gentiles and went back over to the Jews, all out of fear. We should never let our love or fear of men exceed our love for God, no matter what. Okay? Our love for God must be greater than the fear for men. Paul was fearless. He didn't care about how extreme they were. He didn't care about their position, their influence, the part that they had. Paul did not care. Paul let them know that he's a believer in Jesus Christ. He's a follower of Jesus. If it brought persecution on him, then so be it. Okay? He did not sway. He did not bend. He did not do anything to please men. Everything that he did, he made sure that it glorified God. Everything that he did, he made sure that God got the credit. It wasn't glorifying himself. So we must not give in to pressure. No matter who's putting pressure on us, we should never give in to pressure to the point where now we made ourselves a hypocrite. And then we will be blessed. So we must, not, we must not put down that cross that Jesus said, no, you pick up your cross and follow me. See, we must never put that cross down, but if anything, when under pressure, let's hold on that cross even tighter than before. We're most susceptible to being a hypocrite, see, when it comes to things of the world. See, as Jesus said, we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be part of it. And this is what happens so often. But so often, see, we make ourselves part of the world. And as soon as we make ourselves part of the world, then we're making ourselves a hypocrite. And that's what the world sees. The world's not stupid. They know good and well what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. When we're around people of the world, do we, do we act like them? Or do we act like a Christian? Do we live like a Christian regardless of where we're at? Who we are with? What we are doing? See, if not, then it comes across as a hypocrite. See, God is with us all the time. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He hears every single thing that we say that leaves our lips. He sees every single thing that we do. He knows every bit, all our thoughts. We can't fool God. And that's who we're trying to please. In closing, let's look at verses 19 through 21 in closing. In verse 19 it says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. Paul saying, yes, he died to the law. He knows that you can't be saved by works. He's saying that we must not Focus on works. We are not saved by works, not at all. Okay? We do good works, and we will be rewarded for our good works in heaven. But we are not saved by our good works. So Paul is saying here, we must focus on grace. We must focus on living for Christ. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul saying he was crucified with Christ. Our flesh should have been crucified with Christ when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We were born again in the Spirit. 
That means we crucified our flesh. So now we live for Christ. And this is what Paul is saying. You see, sin comes from our human nature. But when we were born again, we now have a divine nature. Which means now we have the power to say no to sin. Out in the world, you don't. Out in the world, you all you know is sin. You don't have the power to overcome sin. Once you're born again with that divine nature, Holy Spirit living in you, working with your conscience, you have the power now, and the Bible tells you that, to say no to sin. Okay. So Paul is saying we, we must let go. Let Christ live in us. Let him take over our life. Let him live in us. See, we must live in faith. We must live in Jesus, and we must live for Jesus. But we must let go and let him live in us. Verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Righteousness cannot be gained he says law works. Righteousness cannot be gained through works. Many people want to believe that to so make them feel good. No. It cannot. You must believe that. Righteousness only comes from Jesus Christ. When we give our life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We're still sinners, but you know when God looks at us, if we're born again, you know who he sees? He sees Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit living inside of us. So he sees righteousness. I see you as sinners. You see me as sinner. God sees us as righteous because of Jesus Christ living in us. Amen. Say amen to that, brother. <laughs> So if righteousness only comes from Jesus Christ, then it only comes from him. Let's do what Paul says here. Let's live for Christ. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's not live to satisfy people. Who cares what they think of us? Their opinion of us won't take us to heaven. They'll take us to hell. <laughs> Who cares about their opinion? Yeah. Their opinion didn't pay for my sin debt. Christ's blood did. So that's what has to be important in our life. Those are the important things in life. This little short life that we live. Amen? Amen. I said enough preaching for today. So let's bow our heads in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, Father, we humbly come before you. Thank you for the message today, Father. Of what's really important in life. We cannot live a life as a hypocrite, a life of hypocrisy. We must live a life for who we really are. We, have been, we are children of God. You called us into your kingdom. Your Holy Spirit now lives inside of us. We must accept that fact and live that fact out that we are a child of God. And not to live any other life, not to be part of the world, not to live some hypocritical life that sustains that opinion they have about us that we're just hip hypocrites, Father. Let's show them no. We have the, the power of God living in us. Jesus Christ living in us. That we are the light of the world. Let's show them that love, that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness, that kindness that's in us. Let's show it to the world. Show them that we love them no matter what, Father. Help us now walk this a path of righteousness but that comes from Jesus Christ. Help us to remain obedient and faithful in the life that we live. A faithful life to you, God. So when we go to bed each night that we, know, we can go to bed in peace knowing that we lived a life that was pleasing to you, that we did not live a life that day to please people, Father. But Father, we cannot do it on our own, so we ask your Holy Spirit now to work in each of us in a mighty way, Father. To continue that work that he says he will not finish until that work is complete. And that means until we come, become one with Christ, Father. Father, help. Father, we love you dearly. Help us strengthen that love for us. 
help that determination to, to live a life that is pleasing to you only. Help us in that regard, Father. And then when we do fall short in sin, Father, that we quickly go on our knees and ask for forgiveness, Father. Father, thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. Help us day to day, Father, as we walk, that knowing that we're walking in your love, we're walking in your grace and in your mercy. Help us now show this love, this grace, and mercy to others in all that we do. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We go. As we continue, uh, worship our Lord and Savior. We have three songs here. Now these